There's a really interesting article out now. It's in the Washington Post. It's entitled 140 million Americans have had coronavirus, according to blood tests analyzed by the CDC. This is the CDC's seroprevalence survey. They have done something. I don't know exactly what, because it's not a full-fledged academic publication, but they have done something to estimate the seroprevalence, how many people have had and recovered from coronavirus. And the answer is 140 million Americans, according to this Washington Post report. There are a few things here that we need to talk about and that haven't been given adequate justice, I think, in the coverage of this topic. Number one, this is not something that should be released uh, all at once. It's something that there should have been a website this whole time, and we should have been performing random seroprevalence assays on a number of places across this country so we could have watched that continuously at all ages for different groups, even based on occupational status. This was not done in a publicly reported way, in a transparent way. There were a few independent groups that tried to do this along the way, such as the Santa Clara seroprevalence study. They got attacked viciously for, for their study. I don't want to get into all the arguments about the study, but I do think that one thing we need to ask ourselves is why were they in charge of doing that study at all? It's not really what they should have been doing. It should have been done by the CDC and it should have been done very broadly, nationally, representatively, um, even in the spring of 2020 and certainly throughout the pandemic. That would have been important information. Number two natural immunity. I think we now know very clearly from data published in MMWR that somebody who had COVID-19 and recovered from COVID-19 has a very, very, very low probability of ever being hospitalized again with a reinfection of COVID-19. That's, I think, the most important result. Not, will you have a breakthrough? It's very likely that that person will have a breakthrough, even if they've had COVID once, a few years later, a year later, they may have another breakthrough. We all know people in our lives who've had a Delta and then an Omicron or what you have you. But the real question is, when you get that second infection, are you at risk of going to the hospital with the same propensity as if you got that first infection? And the answer appears to be that's not the case. Some of that might be selection bias, that people who are very vulnerable have unfortunately passed away from the first infection. Uh, the other part of it has to do probably with adaptive immunity and that they have a more robust immune response among those who have recovered. But be that as it may, I think it's clear. Natural immunity is very protective against reinfection and subsequent hospitalization. The next point. We did a lot of things throughout this pandemic, I think. We did lots of things to quote-unquote flatten the curve, and we did things to delay the infection. And in my mind, it's logical that if you delay the infection from, let's say, an infection you might have had November 2020, and you push that out to April or May 2021, well, you've done yourself a world of good. Because by May 2021, almost anyone adult who wished in this country could have been vaccinated. And so that infection that they might have had in November and had a, I think, a much worse outcome, they've now been vaccinated and they have again in May, and they have a much better outcome. That vaccination has reduced the risk of very bad outcomes. So that makes sense to me. But if you're somebody who has already been vaccinated, continuing to take draconian efforts to push that breakthrough infection further and further out, um, that doesn't make as much sense to me because I think your risk of bad outcomes is as good as it's going to be. You're not getting any younger and you have to balance that potential, balance all the suffering you have to go through to try to delay that infection, giving up on social gatherings, having to wear a, I think, a high quality respirator grade mask without any error, which maybe many people are not able to do. And is that worth it to just merely delay the breakthrough infection? And I struggle with that. But one thing that I think is clear is that somebody whose school was closed, somebody whose work was closed, somebody who didn't go to weddings, somebody who had their life disrupted in ways that they didn't control, but other people controlled it for them, and if that person developed COVID-19 before they were able to get a vaccination, all that disruption to their life, all that inconvenience only did them harm because they got the virus anyway, despite the disruption prior to getting a vaccine. So their odds of beating it are going to be the same as it would have been if they had gotten it much sooner. But they gave up something along the way. They may have given up a year of education or 18 months of school. And that's where this, I think, comes in. In this Washington Post article, there is a table, and I'm going to put it right on the screen. Five-minute mark. I always have to check the timing so I know where to put these things in. Okay, I'm going to put it right on the screen. And what it's going to be is a figure of the seroprevalence by age. And what it shows you in kids under 17, they have the absolute highest seroprevalence by January 2022 of any age group. What does that mean? And this seroprevalence is like almost 60%. It's high. 
That means that for many, many children who had their school closed and taken away from them, who weren't allowed to go on play dates, who had their sporting events canceled, if 60% of them nonetheless developed COVID-19, all that was for naught. They had a huge decrement in their quality of life, in their education, in their social mobility, and their upward mobility, and they got COVID anyway in 60% of the cases. They could not have benefited from those policies. Those policies could only have harmed people who got COVID prior to vaccination. Now, of course, this is not a fully unvaccinated group. Between 12 and 17, there are likely to be some people who have been vaccinated, but we do have all the estimates, and we do know. Um, it's not going to be a ton. From 5 to 11, we know about 20% of people have been vaccinated. It's a little bit higher in the 12 to 17 group. But, you know, you can you can fit that in. Maybe we're talking about, you know, in the – maybe we're talking about um, – uh, 40% of kids or 50% of kids, maybe not 60% of kids or something like that, or maybe it's 30 to 40% of kids, but be that as it may, whatever that fraction is of kids who got COVID-19 anyway, despite their school being closed and prior to vaccination, they could only have been harmed from restrictions. I think that's the key point. They could only have been harmed from restrictions. Then the question is, is there enough of a benefit in the other group of kids to, to offset that harm to to these kids that are only harmed. And I would contend that even in that other group of kids, there's very likely to be a net vector of harm because COVID-19, although it poses a real risk to kids, that risk is small. We have German data that captures that risk, I think, rather nicely that I've talked about in my Substack. And the loss of education for those kids is just so catastrophic, so much larger. And I see some people say that, well, school closure um, is the way to protect disadvantaged and vulnerable kids. I think they've got it entirely backwards. School closure is the most penalizing for disadvantaged and vulnerable kids. So the first point I want to make here is that anybody who had severe restrictions placed on them, who developed zero positivity anyway, could not have experienced benefits from those restrictions. Pri who developed zero positivity anyway prior to vaccination could not have developed benefit from those restrictions. I think that's a fact. And in other places like the United Kingdom, we're talking about zero positive um, as high as 90%, you know, very, very high numbers of zero positivity. Um, and when you talk about that level of zero positivity, um, you know that any school closures in that country merely uh, harmed 90% of people. End of story. The next point. There's another graphic here, and that is that is a map that looks at zero prevalence by state. And it's not all the same. I mean, there are places in this country that have been lit up by COVID-19. They have faced a brunt of COVID-19, particularly Wisconsin, which appears to be the highest state. I would love to see the zero prevalence county by county, age by age. What is the zero prevalence in San Francisco County for a four-year-old? What is the zero prevalence in Madison, Wisconsin for a uh, five-year-old? I think that's very relevant information. One, I think it has implications for vaccination. If somebody is seropositive, they had COVID and recovered from COVID, and you know the risk of getting COVID again and being hospitalized is super, super low from the CDC's own analysis that was published in MMWR, um, the risk-benefit calculus, I think, to give them multiple doses of vaccine shifts a little bit, and that has to be taken into account. I think the other thing to note here is that places that have low seroprevalence are the places that are going to get hit with the most breakthrough in the future. They're the most vulnerable places because breakthroughs may happen in Wisconsin, but at least 60% of people have had the virus and cleared the virus, so their probability of being hospitalized from a reinfection is very low. But in other states where it's very low seroprevalence, there's a huge fraction of people who could potentially be hospitalized all at once from a reinfection. That risk is going to be a little bit higher, I think we know from MMWR data. We need this information in a very granular, real-time level, and that will allow us to, I think, make better choices around vaccine policies and around thinking through what we have gained from these restrictions. So I would say that, hypothetically, there may be a county where you're talking about 90 95% of kids who have had COVID-19. That county may still be debating or thinking about school closure, or that county may have had prolonged school closures. If you've had prolonged school closures and 95% of the kids got COVID-19 prior to vaccination anyway, you have done nothing of value. You've only harmed those kids, and it would be really important to know where those places are. It would also be important to know because in those places, they absolutely should not do it again. Now, even places with low prevalence should not do it again ever. I think it's a foolish mistake for this virus at least, but I think if you have a high prevalence, you it's a no-brainer you shouldn't do it again. 
So I think this is something that we've not talked about enough, which is the seroprevalence stuff. And I think I worry that we have seen a reluctance to treat natural immunity as a vaccine equivalent or reluctance to even treat it as any sort of immune protective event at all. And that reluctance might mean that an organization would be reluctant to publicize and catalog positive seroprevalence results. And I think that would be a perverse tension that we just can't have. I think going forward, I think we need a system where I do not think you can have a federal agency whose leader is appointed by a political party, a uh, political appointee running these kinds of scientific data collection. And maybe we need to separate two things, the data collection and the dissemination from the policy making. Policy making will always be a political enterprise and you'll need a politician to do that whether you like it or not. And your recourse is to vote that person out, but you need some way to balance the will of the people in policy making. But scientific gathering and data collection and dissemination, that is not inherently a political activity. It can inform political activities, but not inherently a political activity. But to have the same person control that space is very problematic. They can selectively present information that suits their own purpose and that suits their own policies and not show you information that may con contradict their own policies or show the folly of their policies. And that I think we need an impartial agency to kind of tackle that problem. And that agency must have some commitments. There must be an obligatory commitment to publish what you collect. Um, we read in a, another story um, in the New York Times that uh, the CDC has uh, volumes of data from wastewater data to seroprevalence data to, to data on breakthrough by race and age um, that they are not disseminating. Uh, that is vital data for people to look at and think about. And it is not in their purview not to give us that data, and not in a free society, certainly. So I think that needs to be under the auspices of a different scientific umbrella. And going forward, I suspect that there will be an appetite to cleave the CDC, I think, and to break it up into, into more manageable pieces. Um, very likely, we will need some policy arm. That should be under the political auspices. But we need a scientific arm that's capable of generating real-time data that can inform decision-making. But my thesis is simple. My thesis is that anybody who got COVID-19 anyway prior to vaccination being offered to them is somebody who only faced harms of restrictions insofar as they faced restrictions. They could not have faced benefit. They could not have experienced benefit. And I think that's true, just um, logically true. And then the question is, if that fraction is very, very high, you have an uphill battle to prove your restriction actually had a net benefit to the population. If that fraction is really, really high, it is almost theoretically at the outset impossible for your restriction to have had benefit. That's a key factor. And that is also, I think, an important thing that we'll need to think about going forward as we restructure, I think, emergency response in general. So those are my thoughts. The CDC article is entitled 140 million Americans have had coronavirus according to blood tests analyzed by the CDC. It came out February 28th. Um, it's an important uh, piece of information and I wish we had a lot more data here. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. And uh, until next time.